Hello and welcome to uh, History with James exclusive web content. And what we're talking about today is, is important to uh, what are the upcoming podcasts, the next two ones, okay? And why do I say that? Well, uh, we're going to talk about nationalism. What is nationalism? Well, in particular, European nationalism. However, um, Turkish nationalism is important for the period we begin to look at. And for the purpose of creating a standard definition of nationalism, we will use the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a nationalist movement or government. I'm just kidding. That's not that's the number two option. But don't you love when they give you a definition and they just go, uh, of a nation or, you know, something like that. Anyway, so it's loyalty and de devotion to a nation, especially a sense of national consciousness, ex exalting one nation above all others and placing prim primary emphasis on promotion of its culture and interest as opposed to those of other nations or uh, super, super, uh, supranational groups. Okay, so basically what happens here is important for both episodes of the po two podcasts coming up. Uh, one minute we're going to talk about the Greek Civil War, and two we're going to talk about um, World War One. And I, I think that's a good time to look at it because it's one of those wars that just kind of keeps creeping and creeping um, out of the national consciousness. And I'm going to try to do this mostly from my own head because I have studied Europe uh, quite extensively. Uh, my primary focus when I got my degree was um, Europe. So, uh, Europe and world, but 98% of the uh, courses were Europe. So anyway, explaining this. Okay, so people argue the French Revolution is a sense of nationalism. Um... Well, I guess it is the beginning of uh, French nationalism. You already have a sense of, uh, you know, the British Empire in India and these types of things and what it means to be British, right? And that's in effectively being uh, propagated during this time. Uh, but let's go with some really good examples. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about France. Um, by the time of the French Revolution, and this is coming from when I was listening to podcasts, uh, it's it's great. It's called uh, they have iTunes iTunes U series, right? And Yale University has uh, European civilization. I don't know. It was like sixteen hundred to uh, forty six, maybe. I don't know. Perhaps of that. So they talk about they have one on nationalism. They have one on um, I think it's John. Why am I not drawing? Um, he does most of them. His name is John. Is it one John? Uh, I can't remember his name actually. Let me try and see get on my iTunes view and see if it comes up. But they're they're basically free if you wanted to listen to them. You get like a lot of uh, subject matter. They're not as narrow focused. They tend to be pretty broad. Um, and that's the nature of these things because we're tr they're trying to cover a lot of topics in a short amount of time, right? Let's see. I want to say that there's... Is there info? Get info, maybe? John Merriman, and he's mostly primarily a French guy. And what do I mean by that? His area of expertise is France. There's some stuff he said about Germany, which I've done a lot of studying about Germany, um, including the rise of the German state, and these types of things. Now, whew, okay. And, you know, he talks about some of the German stuff didn't make sense to me. Uh, but the French stuff seems pretty right on. I mean, I'm not as skilled in French stuff. Um, the, the, a lot of the stuff that I know about French are the philosophers of uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, Descartes, um, D Diderot, I think it's Diderot. Um, see, I'm trying to think of the... Candide, you know, these types of things. Uh, Montesquieu, uh, Rochereau. Um, these type of things, but that you know, I do know a little bit of modern stuff. Um, I'm trying to look for an interesting 
Okay, so anyway, let's just go for some of the, of the examples. So John Merriman has this thing, um, you know, Yale University, uh, iTunes U, European Civilization, 1648 to 1945. It's great. It goes over all kinds of subject. However, again, lots of broad strokes. You're not going to get. Um, you're not going to get as much um, narrow focus as I've been trying to, like we do here. But you know, it's good if you want to expand some of your overall knowledge. Oh God, somebody's trying to use uh, Yahoo Answers to get to the bottom. So basically, okay. So Germany exists in. Uh, let's just take a year for example. Um, Germany, um, 1755. I'm just picking a year that I know before na German, German nationalism prize. If there's a good map, I hope there is. I had to study these maps when I took, um, but they're so much harder. Hmm. Let me type German States map. Okay, and what is Germany is basically a collection. No, this is wrong too. I'm going to type German states 1800. Let's see what comes up. This is such a hodgepodge of. Okay, if you look at the map of Germany, let's just type, you know, you're typing yourself a. Um, just just type in you know germ why uh, german states 18 1800 so you can find a good map not something that's very vague but then again borders were vague back then uh german let me just type in german states 1800 yes Okay, this is a pretty good one, but it's in German. I don't speak German. I know a few words in German, but if I can't find a decent map, I'll just go on explaining it. Uh, it's so hard to find good maps these days. Is this it here? Uh, okay, hopefully we can get a decent picture of this and see what it looks like. This is German Empire. No, we're not talking about the German Empire. Okay, let's just do broad strokes then. Essentially what happens is Germany exists as different states. Um, Prussia, Hesse, um, uh, Prussia, Hesse, um, Okay, so you got Prussia, you got Saxon de Deutsch, Bavaria, Kingdom of Bavaria, Kingdom of uh, Wurttemberg, um, you got Westphalia, I think, Kingdom of Hanover, and most of these are based around like almost like city states. What do I mean by that? Well, um, you'll notice the, for example, the Kingdom of Bavaria. Bavaria is a region that has Munich. These places, Kingdom of Württemberg. Württemberg is a pretty popular city-state. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Hanover. There's a city, Hanover. You know, these types of things. But culturally, Germans spoke the same language. Now, this is where it gets a little bit out of what the subject matter we're talking about here. But um, they basically spoke the same language. Uh, but and they were broken down like sort of these city states: Saxony, Kingdom of Saxony, which has the city of Dresden, and I think it's Leip Leip Leipzig. I could be wrong. My German isn't that great. But anyway, so you're talking about all these different city states, and eventually Prussia becomes the cultural dominant, you know, and they and they pretty pretty much unite all the German states. <clears throat> There's war all over the place in Europe to establish this. And people ask, well, why do they not include Austria? Well, good question. The Austrian Empire, as it was called, and there was the Russian Empire, and there was um, the Netherlands, which is independent, and you had France, um, and Switzerland. Switzerland was not really a power, per se. They were just sort of um, there, because if you look at the, the same case in Italy, 
Italy was ruled by uh, France, Austria, and so forth and so on. I think the uh, only real exception is Rome. Now, I could be wrong about Rome because it's a Catholic, you know. Um, okay, so for us you have Donzic, which is a key port city. Uh, you got some other important cities there. Berlin is also in within Prussia. And Berlin becomes the cultural sphere, you know, pretty much of Germany. And what happens is it unites. And there's a key exception to this uniting of all these states. And basically think of Germany, and that's what you got. Now, what is the difference here? Well, the question became what to do with Austria. Okay, now Austria, there's this, uh, peop uh, people uh, who speak, you know, um, speak German too also. But the problem with Austria-Hungary, or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, probably not called that then, just the Austrian Empire, was that it, con it contained many minorities. Now, in central to a uh, nationalist identity is a, a group, an ethnic group or people who speak the same language and these types of things. Well, Austria contained many different ethnic minorities, the Poles, the uh, Czechs, uh, Bohemia, as it was called back then. Uh, can turn Serbs, uh, Croats, I'm just trying, I'm going on and on, Lithuanians, well, no, it's mostly Russians, uh, you know, Croats, uh, parts of, Pol you know, Poland, Poles, Hungarians, and, and uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other places that were under Austro-Hungarian rule. Um, that's a tough one. Okay, and they were, and, and they were all, um, they were sort of a multi-ethnic empire, and that would sort of demean, you know, this national spirit of, you know, speaking German and being culturally German, right? And that's what you know nationalism was about. If you notice, at the time of the French Revolution, um, which we get back to our example of France, I'll try it because this is John Merriman, not me, because I'm not a French expert, but I know more about Germany than I do. I know more about Germany and Russia and the um, Eastern Baltics and these types of things. Now, let's see here. Where do we get to this now here? Um, basically, we get to the France example. Now, before the French Revolution, or about the time of the French Revolution, less than about half the population of France did not speak French. Now. This lets you know that the lang this is again John Merriman pretty much uh, quoting or kind of summarizing his own thoughts. And I, you know, I thought about it myself. We get the same example in Europe here is that once um, you know, France starts to build itself up, you know, you get, um, and, and of course, you look at Napoleon, and Napoleon's army is made up of all kinds of different ethnic people. And well, what, and what unites them, or what unites the French Empire? Well, the French Empire, including parts of Africa and, and these places, what unites is they're French speakers. Now, you know, that sets them apart from the English and the Germans and these types of things. Now, what these created, these rivalries, and I won't get too much into that because they're very important in our next two episodes, but we can also go to the example of Turkey. Um, Turkey loses, we've already talked about this in part, I forget what episode, but Turkey loses parts of its, uh, it loses most of its European territories, or most of it, I can't remember the exact percentage. Um, you know, th these are like, uh, whew, let's look this up because it's very important for what we're talking about here. Um, I think it was the episode we talked about, um, Armenian Genocide. Now, let's see if I can find, sorry, I'm going to try to find it. Let's just go on our words documents. Because these days I don't do too many word documents. I should be able to find it. PBS, Armenian Genocide. Okay. Bum, 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 Okay, so the Christian regions of Greece and the Balkans, starting in 1913, rebelled and drove the Ottomans from 75% of the European lands. Now, what does this actually do? Well, it almost becomes because, you know, um, the, Turk, the Ottoman Empire was pretty much a, um, a multi-ethnic empire as well as, you know, the Austrian Empire. But then what turns it, what it turns in is the Turks, you know, the main group of this um, empire, they turn inwards and they start to, you know, um, 
what we call the Young Turks, right? This return to Turkish, you know, we're going to return the Turks to power, um, using them as scapegoats. I'm trying to figure out, I probably said this, and the episode will go more into detail of this if you will listen to the one about the Armenian Genocide. You'll notice a, a, a big tie to the, um, you know, early late 1800s and early 1900s, this rise of, um, you know, sort of these states, you know, thinking um, it leads eventually to different conflicts. And you can go to the Greek-Turkish War, you can go to the, um, uh, you can go all over the place, all over Europe. And see, here's the weird thing, is that these groups, um, you know, the French, um, so eventually, okay, Germany becomes a state, it has battle with France, and it wins the... Um, Alzheimer's, uh, I don't know, I'm always having trouble with saying that one. It's basically this region between Germany and France where the speakers are, Ger they speak German, but uh, it's been under French rule for a while. I think it's called Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Lausanne. Uh, I'm trying to find it. Maybe it's this one. No, I'm not a very good speller. But anyway, it's this region basically in between France and Germany that Germany takes uh, during its, you know, conquest for its own German state. Um, you know, and it pretty much becomes this region. And, um, you know, that's all history. And there's just a bunch of bad blood between the, you know, the French and the Germans because they both have this ideology that should be theirs and the sort of mythology it develops, which eventually leads us to World War I, but I won't discuss that. Okay, so within the Turkish example, right, the Turks turn inwards and there's a revolution that overthrows the government. Um, let's see here. Uh, Armenians hope for the reform. Yeah, overthrew, overthrew, so the young Turks overthrew the government in 1908. Um, push for progressive reforms. Christian, so they, you know, and they lose 75% of their lands, and this doesn't, um, this creates it even more radical, you know, when they lose the European lands, it creates another European, uh, a radical wing of the Young Turks. We're talking, you know, this is from the Armenian uh, Genocide episode, if you go back to there, you can look at this, and what you see is a more radical wing of the Young Turks takes power, and the Committee of Union and Progress, their main goal was a Turkish homeland, they, thus begins Turkish nationalism. And um, so caught up in a false sense of power, the Turks joined the Germans to create a Turkic empire. The primary target was Russia. So by defeating Russia, now why is this so important? The Russians smashed the Turks in so many wars before. And the rise of Russian nationalism, Peter the Great, the Tsar and Axis to the Sea, the Russians, uh, Peter the Great was um, obsessed with bringing the Russians to greatness. And what do I mean by that? Well, he came from a class of people called the Boyars. And the Boyars were the nobility class inside Russia before Peter the Great. Um, takeovers just happened pretty much um, violently and there was no direct ascension to the Tsar throne. But Peter the Great travels all of Europe, and he wants to emulate the powers of Europe and create a Russian identity. You can also see this later on in the late 1800s. The Russians create their own, want to create their own style of music, of the classical arts that is distinctly Russian, you know, to uplift the people. And they, they could, um, chronicle these battles against the French, where they defeat the French and um, Russia and stuff like that. But he wants to create a navy, and he turns south to Turkey to take these lands to create a, a, a Russian empire, right? uniquely Russian. The only problem was, um, you know, Russia was deprived of any sea lanes and these types of things. But he was, Peter the Great was obsessed with shipbuilding and wanted to, so by getting to the Black Sea, and there's a huge war between the Turks and the Russians in this period, 1700s, 1600s, 1700s, and all the way into the 1800s. And it goes all the way into World War One because the, you know, the the Turks fight the Russians in uh, World War One, and we won't get too much into that too. But we'll just explain to you that the the, the Russians wanted to, for their own national glory, and their own you know national identity and glo you know this sort of sense of uh, Russian identity is built off of taking Turkic Turkic land to get access to the. Um, 
to get to the to the um, to the Black Sea, right, and have access, which eventually to the Mediterranean and all these trade routes, and to make Russia great. Now, in this sense, when the Turkic nationalists take power, they they want to create a Turkic empire for space for living for the Turkish people. Um, the problem was they didn't have the capacity to carry it out. They had fanatical, like I said, they were fanatics, uh, you know, even more radical than the young Turks that took power. And they were fanatical in their, um, their mission. And also, too, uh, you know, sort of deprived of certain senses of humanity and these types of things with the Armenian Genocide, which we have already done an episode of. But if we just go a little bit, we're going to try to wrap this up. Wow, this has been really long. But we notice, too, well, all the power, you know, uh, Germany, um, okay, so Germany eventually, you know, becomes a power now, too. And they're sort of the new kids on the block, and they get territory in Africa and all this stuff. And the weird thing is the powers meet in the Berlin Conference of, um, I don't want to say it's 1894. Let me just pull this up real quick. They meet in Germany, right? It's almost like a, you know, a coming out party for Germany. Uh, let me see, Berlin Conference. 1884-1885, also known as the Congo Conference. And now what it does is it divides up Africa because the European powers are, you know, there's sort of a tension because these are taking ter territories. And you can pull up a map of Sub-Sahara sub sub Africa, uh, Berlin Conference, and you'll see all the different countries. And they basically divide all of Africa and say, hey, there's a piece of the pie for everybody, right? Interesting how that works out, because if you, if you notice what they do here, you know, the, everybody gets a piece of the pie type of thing, right? Um, you know, even within a sense, the... Um, Americans sort of carved out a piece of Liberia for the, you know, to remain independent. The Empire of Ethiopia, which for by all means I could not figure out why it remains independent, an independent kingdom. Um, it's not because Somalia is that great, or I mean Ethiopia is that great. Um, it's a really interesting question, which I wasn't able to really solve. There's always, like, there's always that one exception in, in imperialism where they leave countries independent such as the example of Thailand. So what we get with this nationalism, and we even have an interesting example within Indonesia. Now, Indonesia is basically a multi-ethnic um, group of people, the largest being the Japanese, and then you have Malays, and then you have Chinese, and then you have just a whole host of people, uh, Papuans, I think. In certain parts, but that's an occupation. If you wanted to go into that, Papuan people. Um, okay, so basically, how that works is that they were educated by the Dutch, and then they get this sense of we want to be a country now and be a, a united country. And this is so weird because the European influence extends all the way to Asia. I mean, you look at almost every country in Southeast Asia, you will find an example of an, uh, a collection of people coming together to form a nation. I mean, it come, it, uh, in the Philippines is sort of an odd example of this, too, within the American example. There's sort of this Philippine nationalism. Um, you, you, well, it's more of a Spanish influence, sort of, at the very beginning, and then it becomes sort of an American influence. Because if you look at, if you look at the Philippines, you have eight ethno-linguistic groups, and that's sort of ethnic groups based on linguistics, although they probably have similar heritage and these types of things. But then they create this identity... Um, you know, centered on being a nation, and this is sort of a Western influence. But, you know, they sure up all this stuff at the Berlin Conference, right? But what ends up happening is we see that it doesn't really resolve the issue because in their own home, you know, uh, I don't know if the expression, there has an expression about, you know, taking care of your, in your own home first or these types of things. Um, there was just so much turmoil bullying because we had the unsolved question, and I'll point this to you because this will be an important part of um, this will be an important part of some of the upcoming material. Now people say, "Well, what's the other half of the Austrian Empire becomes the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and um, what does that mean necessarily?" Well. The Hungarians were um, 
unhappy within this place but if you look at right if you look at the Austro-Hungarian Empire it's sort of a contradiction of this you know nationalist thing going on because here's an empire of different peoples you know Czechs I guess um, Slovaks um, parts of Ukraine um, Romanians Hungarians uh, Serbs Croats you got all these people in this empire here and it's interesting that this can exist within a nationalist Europe and so with that I'll leave you with that comment anyway this is James signing off and saying good luck <laughs>